Members, it is time for question time. I must remind members that questions 2 and 11 have been withdrawn. Uh, Mr Chris Hazard is not in his place, so I call uh, Mr Lord Morrow. To answer questions 3 and 7 together as they both relate to Northern Ireland Civil Service voluntary exit scheme. I will deal first with uh, Lord Morrow's request for an update. The scheme closed for applications at 5 p.m. on Friday, the 27th of March 2015. My officials are now working closely with departments to manage the process of selection in line with the published selection criteria. All staff who have applied will receive notification of the outcome of the selection process. Staff who receive a notification with a specific exit date and have received a quote from civil service pensions should use this information to decide whether or not they wish to accept the offer of voluntary exit. All staff selected to leave will be given three months' notice. We anticipate those selected to leave under the scheme will do so in tranches between 30 September 2015 and 31 March 2016, subject to the requisite resources being made available. An important part of this process will be maintaining business continuity, and so a range of measures are being put in place, including redeployment arrangements to move staff into essential posts left vacant by staff who leave via the scheme. I can confirm that as of uh, as at the 27th of March 2015, the closing date of the scheme, 7,285 applications to be considered for selection had been received. I would emphasise that we will not know the actual number of staff that will exit via the scheme until selection has taken place and those selected confirm whether or not they wish to accept the offer of voluntary exit. Call Lord Morrow for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his very comprehensive and detailed uh, reply to that question. And I must say it is quite startling that over 7,000 have already applied for this uh, scheme. Could the Minister outline for us today uh, the, uh, what impact does not processing with the welfare reform scheme have on this whole overall scheme? Uh, and does he feel that this will, in fact, have a detrimental impact in taking this scheme forward for those who want to be in it? I agree with the um, noble lord that uh, 7,285 uh, applications, and of course, it won't be 7,285 people who will be exiting the civil service, uh, and we won't require anywhere near that number. But I, I can recall, Mr. Deputy Speaker, being in a television studio the day before the scheme launched and being quizzed repeatedly uh, badgered, some might even say, by a presenter as to what would happen if we didn't get towards 2,400 that we estimated uh, that we needed to exit, and I think we've, we've far surpassed uh, that, as the answer has revealed. The member is right to highlight the concern. I have, there are concerns that I have, and I know they're shared right across uh, the executive and, 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 indeed, within the senior civil service. And the member will recall, and the House will remember, that as part of the Stormont House Agreement, there was a, a public sector transformation fund, some £700 million of access to borrowings, 200 in the first three years and the final year of £100 million, that was to fund the voluntary exit scheme, not just for the civil services, which is what we're talking about here, but for the whole and the entire public sector. Um, not having access to that money, which is a, a possibility if we don't proceed with welfare reform, we don't proceed with other aspects of the Stormont House Agreement, would mean that not only, not only could we not access that funding, Mr Deputy Speaker, that £200 million which, is, which is badly needed to fund this exit scheme, but that the savings that would be yielded through our pay bill, which for the civil service alone in this current financial year that we are now in, is around £25 million and, and probably about another £25 million in the broader public sector as well, could be in jeopardy. So it is very, it's imperative that, that we move forward with welfare reform, that we move forward with all aspects of the storm of the House Agreement, for in and of themselves, but particularly in this case because of the timeliness of it, uh, not least because ministers, for example, like the Minister for Education, needs to, if, he's, if teachers are leaving, they need to get their notice very, very soon, so that they are they get that notice and they are able to exit the public service well in advance of the start of the new school year. Well, Mr. Roy Beggs. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Borrowing to enable the voluntary redundancy scheme to go ahead was based, as the Minister said, on welfare reform and the mitigation that was put together with that uh, in the agreement uh, around Christmas time. 
Can the minister advise what will happen to these 7,000 individuals, 7,200-odd individuals, who have thought carefully about their future and applied for life-changing uh, early retirement? What will happen to them if uh, the welfare reform does not proceed? And what will happen to the finances of the Northern Ireland budget if it does not proceed? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, the member asked a very good question. Of course, the seven. There will be many in the 7,285. Well, there will be many who will decide on the basis of what, what figure they get and their own personal circumstances that they don't want to proceed. Uh, and we would expect an attrition rate, and um, we would expect probably around about a third of those people perhaps to say, no, we actually don't want to proceed to the next stage. Um, so it's not all of those 7,285 people who are affected or will be disappointed. Um, there will be, there was always, there was always going to be some who aren't going to be able to exit because of affordability, without the other issues that are swirling around, who wouldn't be able to exit because of affordability issues or the pressures that moving or leaving would put on the, the broader public service. But the member is right to highlight that there will be everybody who has gone to at least this stage has given careful consideration to it. They've looked at it in and of their own circumstances. They have had access to an online calculator which shows what their entitlement is. So most people know, having put this, the, the application forward, more or less what they're entitled to get. So they are making an informed decision to put their name forward. And the member is right to highlight the, the concerns, as I've highlighted already in response to, to Lord Morrow, that the access to that finance, that 200 million, was absolutely critical in the Stormont House Agreement because we don't have the ability to access finan finance from departmental budgets. That's how ordinarily schemes of this nature uh, would be funded. Uh, we aren't able to do that because of the pressures that there are, the innumerable pressures that there are on departmental budgets. So going and making a call on departmental budgets to fund this is not an option. That's why we agreed with the government to access the £200 million through, the, uh, through our borrowing powers. Uh, and if that isn't uh, available, uh, it's obviously a matter, it would be a matter, like many things, would be a matter for an incoming Westminster government to consider what they do in the circumstances. But as I have pointed out in this House and elsewhere before, not having that £200 million, not having the £100 million of payable savings that will accrue this year, and indeed the sizeable payable savings that will accrue in subsequent years, does put extreme pressure uh, on our budget. I call Mr. Sean Lynch. I'm going to and thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, so far, can the Minister outline the protections which are in place uh, to maintain frontline services in the context of the voluntary exit scheme? Mr. Deputy Speaker, yeah, it, it is incredibly important. I think there is. Uh, I know there is some uh, dispute in the House in some corners about how we are financing uh, the exit scheme. I, I don't think there is any dispute. Uh, from any quarter that this is something that we should be doing. In fact, some of us might argue that this is something that we should have been doing a little bit earlier. Um, but we are where we are, and we're proceeding, and we hope, I hope that we can proceed from the point that we are, are currently at, um, if progress is made elsewhere. Um, it is critically important, though, that in reducing the size of our public sector, uh, at a time whenever our private sector is, is growing, um, but in terms of public service delivery, it is important that we ensure that there is uh, continuity of service, and the, I suppose the best intervention that we can make as a public sector or as a civil service to ensure that there is continuity of service and that we minimise disruption to service uh, delivery is timely and planned use of redeployment. Uh, now, within the, the scope of the scheme itself, there are um, departments can uh, use uh, some a limited flexibility to ensure that the timing of, of the release of staff doesn't have an impact on uh, business continuity and service delivery. Um, but it will require us to have a, a better, uh, well thought out, well planned redeployment of staff in some places so that services wherever in Northern Ireland they're being delivered and whatever type of services that they are um, still produce the outcomes that our citizens require. Well, Mr John Dollett. Mr. Deputy Speaker, the voluntary exit scheme certainly may be exciting for those who wish to leave the civil service, but for the 20,000 young people who in the next few years might traditionally have expected to get on the first ring of the uh, jobs ladder, not so funny. Has the Minister, or sorry, has the Treasury expressed any interest in decentralising any of the tens of thousands of jobs in Britain that might well uh, be sent here? Mr. 
Um, Deputy Speaker, I don't think anybody finds any aspect of the voluntary exit scheme a, a laughing matter. Um, and certainly, I, I take it as a, a very serious thing to be doing. I think it's a necessary thing that we have to do, um, but it's very onerous, very um, a serious matter that we have to deal with, and we must deal with it accordingly and in the, the manner appropriate. Um, we also, uh, the member will be aware that we do have, and he will know from his own constituency, and unfortunately, um, uh, respect of the DVLA issue, didn't didn't work out uh, ultimately that well for the constituency, unfortunately. But there are other areas of um, employment where people in Northern Ireland, based in Northern Ireland, are providing public services to people who live in other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, one particular area is the Social Security Agency. Uh, there are people who are housed in Belfast and indeed in Londonderry in the North West serving, I'm sure, drawing people from, from his own constituency who are doing work for the Social Security Agency and delivering benefits and assessing benefits for people in the South East of England. I think it's incredibly important that that continues. Uh, however, one threat to that continuing is uh, as Northern Ireland diverges further away from uh, the rest of, if it did indeed diverge further away from the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of welfare, and it has been mentioned in discussions I know between the DSD and DWP in the past, that failure to implement welfare reform in Northern Ireland and therefore having a different system in Northern Ireland is one of the factors that would be considered by DWP in terms of keeping those jobs. Some 1,600 jobs, I think, are in both locations here in Northern Ireland. Uh, and that go, that's, that's about keeping those jobs that we already have, Mr Deputy Speaker, never mind attracting more uh, from England or other parts of the United Kingdom here to Northern Ireland, Things that I think that, something that I think we're very good at and very capable of. Call Mr Jim Allister. As a compliment to the exit scheme, if it goes ahead, is the minister, has the minister in place a recruitment freeze in respect of the civil service, and if so, for how long? And in regard to the exit scheme, what account will be taken in respect of deciding whether or not to grant an application of the impact that that would have on the balance of the community background within the civil service? Mr. Speaker, I think there were, there were two questions there in a, in a supplementary uh, from the member. Um, there, are, there is a recruitment freeze in place. In fact, it was one of the first uh, strategic personnel interventions that we enacted, uh, even long before the launch of the voluntary exit scheme, because I think it's, um, it, it's important that we, we do a range of men, introduce a range of measures to ensure that uh, the target, the Storm and Castle Agreement target, target of a reduction of 20,000 in our um, public sector. And it has been misreported, I think deliberately, by some people um, that uh, these are 20,000 jobs that will go. These are 20,000 posts, that is the hope, that will go over a period of, of four years. Uh, and some of that will go because of a recruitment freeze. In fact, refreezing recruitment in the civil service has already reduced uh, the number of posts in the civil service by around 1,000 um, because those, those vacancies are not going to be filled in the future. Um, in terms of the issue around community background, uh, a quality screening assessment was done of the scheme uh, beforehand, and it was actually it was screened out. And the reason it was screened out is because, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with, with, a, with a, a few exceptions for some very, very senior grades at permanent secretary level, um, this was a scheme that was open to everybody, given its nature as a voluntary exit scheme. It was open to everybody in the, the civil service to apply for. Um, I don't think that. Um, we can get into a situation. I don't want to get into a situation where, in choosing, I think we have to be clear and methodical in terms of how we choose people exiting on a basis of, of clear set criteria, which have nothing to do, quite frankly, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with somebody's religion. Uh, and I think that, yes, I appreciate that there are issues at both ends of the scale in the senior civil service and at lower ends in different ways in terms of underrepresentation of certain genders and of certain uh, religious backgrounds. But I don't think using a voluntary exit scheme is a way to deal with that particular problem. I think there are other measures that we have to deal with or to introduce to ensure that uh, nobody is dissuaded from applying for posts within the civil service in the future because of their religious background or gender or indeed anything else. I call Mr. Edwin Putz. Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is important that the benefits of prompt payment are shared throughout the supply chain. And this is reflected in the guidelines which my department has set. As the problem has been felt most acutely in the construction industry, centres of procurement expertise are required to monitor the implementation of fair payment requirements in government construction contracts. This information is reported quarterly to CPD and discussed at each meeting of the Construction Industry Forum for Northern Ireland. 
The monitoring regime involves dip sampling to ensure that prompt payment is happening in practice. In 2014, a sample of 15% of payments was validated, with only one irregularity found. This has since been resolved by the relevant centre of procurement expertise. For supplies and services contracts, CPD has implemented standard terms and conditions. These terms and conditions require subcontractors to be paid within 30 days. When issues of non-compliance are highlighted to CPD in projects which it manages, they are pursued with the contractor so as to facilitate early resolution. Mr. Pritch for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister um, if he can give us an assurance that where companies are highlighted um, who are not uh, adhering uh, to the principles that he has outlined, uh, that thorough investigation will take place uh, to identify the ver veracity of the complaints and if they, had a, they are found to be right, that actions will be taken uh, thereupon. Uh, many small companies uh, fear actually. Uh, raising the issue because they believe that they will lose out on contracts and it's incumbent upon us uh, to actually defend these uh, subcontractors and ensure that they are paid uh, in prompt time. Thank the member for his supplementary. Um, Deputy Speaker, um, the measures that, that myself and, and um, more so my predecessor have introduced in this regard have come as a result of um, concerns expressed to us by small businesses, subcontractors within supply chains, particularly in the construction sector. Um, and there's a range of measures have been introduced over the last number of years to try to deal with this issue, which has been highlighted, I suppose, in some very high-profile um, collapses of, of, of local construction firms. Um, we have introduced uh, the ability to have project bank accounts that came in in, in January 2013 for projects of over a million pounds in size with a significant amount of subcontracting going on. There have been 10 pilots chosen for that and the feedback so far is positive and indeed we may well be looking to extend that away from construction and also into supply contracts too. Perhaps more relevant to, to the member's question, a uh, procurement guidance notice was issued in January 2012. It's now been backed up by uh, regulations introduced this year uh, which monitor uh, the performance of main contractors in terms on a range of different ways but including their payment to subcontractors uh, and a certificate of unsatisfactory performance can in appropriate circumstances be issued and indeed those main contractors who are found to be failing to pass on the prompt payment that government is doing the government is very good at paying some 91 percent of our invoices in, in dfp are paid within uh, 10 days um, the those main contractors can be struck off public contracts for 12 months. Now, there has been no single case of that so far, but as I revealed in, in the first answer to the question, there was one of the, the samples uh, last year that was taken that showed that there was uh, some issues, and that was dealt with uh, between my department and that particular main contractor. I rely, and my department relies on, on perhaps companies coming forward, and I accept the point that the member makes about the fear that some people have, but if, 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 if subcontractors are even prepared to go through assembly members or other elected representatives and bring that to my attention, I can assure the member and I can assure the House that those issues will be dealt with with the appropriate seriousness. Remind the Minister about the two-minute rule. Mr Alex Maskey. Can I ask the Minister, could he uh, advise the House if there are any protections or measures in place to ensure that uh, local businesses can actually uh, uh, avail of all subcontracting uh, opportunities? There are no um, particular measures or statutory provisions or anything like that that are in place to ensure they're other than. Um, and what, what, what is found in most cases is that main contractors, even if those main contractors aren't uh, locally based, that they are bringing on, particularly on construction, a large number of uh, locally based subcontractors to do, to do their work and assist them in, in the provision of whatever capital project that it might be. Um, are we, again, like, like, like our prompt payment, we have a good record of uh, letting contracts to, of all types, whether it's construction or supplies contracts, um, to local suppliers in Northern Ireland. I think we have a record uh, which sometimes doesn't get through. Uh, sometimes you, you, know, you, would, you would think, um, listening sometimes even to debates in this House, um, that local suppliers aren't getting on to, um, to deliver government contracts. That's not the case. I think it's over. I think the latest figures are uh, over 70 odd percent of contracts are going to local firms. Indeed, um, around two thirds are going to local SMEs. Um, so we have a good record, not just in terms of prompt payment to contractors, but we've also a very good record as well in Northern Ireland in terms of getting local suppliers 
Uh, and we do that without having to manipulate, because the, the member will be aware that procurement is highly governed by the European Union, and uh, you have to be very careful in terms of what you do at a local level than not to breach European law. Um, so within those laws that are there, we have a very, very good record in this part of the world in ensuring that local suppliers are, are, are getting work. Call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for uh, his answer. Um, in relation to uh, small uh, construction companies accessing uh, government contracts, especially small to medium sized uh, road contracts, I'm hearing that there's a catch-22 situation there, that in some cases, if you're not already on the list, you can't be considered for the list. So I would, I would like to ask the Minister, is he aware of this situation? And if so, is there anything that can be done about it? Mr. Deputy, I was just I was checking the um, precise figure that I gave to Mr. Maskey in, in a previous response. In, in 2013-14, 75% of government contracts were awarded to Northern Ireland firms. So that £2.6 billion pounds more or less is being spent um, every year uh, in Northern Ireland um, on public contracts, centrally led government contracts. 75% of those are going to Northern Ireland firms. Now, we would all like to see that higher, I'm sure, but that's a, a record that compares favourably with other jurisdictions in the, in the British Islands. Um, the particular issue that the, the member raises, I'm not, I haven't been made aware of that. Uh, I suppose in some ways I wouldn't, wouldn't expect to be Roads contracts are obviously taken forward as a responsibility of the Minister for Regional Development. They are a centre of procurement expertise of their own in, in road service or transport NI, I think as it's now called. Um, so I would expect that perhaps he, uh, Mr. Minister Kennedy, would have a better appreciation of a, that problem if there was. And I would encourage the, the member to draw any con particular concerns that he has from his locality to the Minister for Regional Development's attention, or if not, through myself. And I'm happy to, to pass them on to Minister Kennedy. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Principal. Deputy Speaker, question number five. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The executive agreed back in 2012 to undertake a revaluation re in response to calls from the business sector. My assessment is, is that it was the right thing to do, and it has helped to rebalance the rating system. We could not have continued to ask commercial ratepayers to pay business rates that are shared out on the basis of 2001 rental levels, given the fundamental changes that have taken place in the way people live work, shop and go about their business. This exercise in redistribution does, however, mean that there are both winners and losers. I can't go into all of the, uh, the effects of the revaluation now, but take, for example, the retail sector. The outcome is that there are far more winners than losers. Many of our high streets and town centres have benefited, but there are others, such as modern convenience stores and large outage or out-of-town food stores, who are now paying a lot more than they did before. This reflects our success in the real world, and it also mirrors the relative decline of many of our traditional shopping areas. At the end of the day, it is not LPS or DFP who decide who should pay more or who should pay less. The property market has already done that. The problem for some stems from the gap between this revaluation and the last one. It could be argued that those now paying more should have been paying it well before now. Finally, it is worth pointing out that the revaluation does not raise more money from the system for the Assembly. The regional rate has actually gone down a little to reflect a modest overall increase in values and thereby fulfil the executive's commitment to ensure this revaluation is revenue neutral in real terms. Call Mr. Rogers for a supplementary. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, you, might, you talk about winners and losers, but to me, I, I haven't found very many winners in this situation in South Down, in towns like Kilkeel, Newcastle, and Castle Well. What can the department do in order to keep the shutters going up when you have businesses like a pound shop where the rates have gone from 6,200 to 16,200? How can you convince people like that and many others that they can, they can, what can the department do to keep them open? Well, it's not my job to, 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 to keep businesses open uh, in that sense, you know, and it's not my job to step in and, and to do that. The, um, you know, what we have done through the uh, rating system over the last number of years is to, to be incredibly generous uh, through the support that we have given in the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, for example, which has ensured 
that um, over half of all business properties in Northern Ireland are getting at least 20 per cent off their rates. We continue to keep in place industrial derating, uh, which offers over £60 million pounds worth of support to uh, many businesses, many of our bigger businesses in Northern Ireland. And, and a revaluation will always produce winners and losers. I think the important point for uh, the member in the House to note is that the Assembly does not raise any more money through the regional rate as a result of the revaluation. It merely redistributes money from one section of ratepayers to another section of ratepayers to reflect where the market has gone and changes in circumstances that have affected where the market has gone. And there will always, in those sets of circumstances, be some winners and there will always be some losers. Um, and there will be some winners in his constituency uh, and there will be some losers in his constituency, just as there are in every constituency across Northern Ireland. Uh, I think it is significant, though, to note that the Northern Ireland Independent Retail Trade Association, who would uh, had called for the revaluation to go ahead whenever the, um, the revaluation results were published. Uh, their chief executive, Glenn Roberts, said that we welcome the outcome of the rates revaluation and are particularly pleased that it has addressed the unfair imbalance of large out-of-town multiple rate retailers paying less rates per square foot than many of our members in town centres. This is a, quote, win-win for our independent retailers in town centres. Now, I'll accept that it's not every town centre and it's not every retailer but what it has done is tried to more fairly redistribute where the rates burden should lie, reflecting those changes over the preceding 13 years. I'll call Mr Gary Middleton. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, what plans does the Minister have for reviewing business rates in Northern Ireland? Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, there has been um, the Chancellor in his recent budget statement announced that um, uh, in England he was going to review business rates. And there have been some who have been calling on me to review. In fact, a member who was in the chamber not that long ago has, in his local press, called on me to review the business rating system in Northern Ireland. Um, actually, two years ago in this House, during a question time, I announced that, uh, in response to a, a member's question, that it was my intention to review business rates in Northern Ireland and to do so after the revaluation re had bedded in. Uh, that process is going to start in the next number of weeks. In fact, we're going to have a an innovation lab which will look at this issue and discuss it with, with retailers and indeed with other businesses as well. Uh, and that will try to, and what I wanted to do, and I, I go into that review um, with an open view on what the outcome should be, Deputy Speaker, and, and I think that um, there is a lot of people who express concern about the rating system. There are some people who don't like the fact that it's based on property values, and there are some who put forward other suggestions as to how it might, 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 might be replaced. Uh, and I'm open to look at all of those possibilities. I'm also open to look at uh, the reliefs and, and alliances that we have in place, which have been there to try to support business, to try to keep business uh, in place and operating through the downturn. And, and let's not forget the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme was an intervention to try to help businesses through a very difficult recession. But many of our retail businesses are still struggling, not because of, of the recession per se, although in some cases it is the effects of that, but because of other lifestyle changes and changes in our town centres and, and the effect of, of, of large out-of-town retailers. So I want to look at all of those issues and a range of other issues as well to make sure that what we have moving forward is a, a suitable system to uh, locally tax our, our businesses. Call Ms. Clare Sultan. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I'll see if I can talk fast to, um, to counteract the Minister's ad-libbing. Um, I, um, I think the revaluation is actually a bit of a shambles, and I have requested a meeting with the Minister to discuss this, and I concur with uh, Mr Lynch. Um, there are certainly very few winners in my constituency. Um, right now, I, I don't expect the Minister to have specific figures to hand, but does he have any idea how many business properties where the net annual value has risen has now made them ineligible for the various thresholds of the rate release schemes? Those, uh, specific figures in, in front of me, but I'm happy to furnish um, the uh, member with them. If she'll forgive me for, for ad-libbing, I, I suppose, um, in her constituency, in, in, um, in East London Derry, if you take Coleraine, for example, which would be, I suppose, the, the principal or premier borough, I don't know how they would describe it, um, the average increase in, uh, as a result of the revaluation went up by 7%. If you take um, High Streets, for example, in the constituency, if you go to Coleraine, so take Church Street, it's... Um, uh, valuation fell by 40 per cent. The diamond in Coleraine, the average, this is the average in the area, and I appreciate there will be differences within it. In the diamond, it went down by 55 per cent, or 45 per cent, sorry. 
Kingsgate Street in, in Coleraine, down by 30 per cent. Uh, Main Street in Garva is down as well. Egg, you know, so there, there are a range of, I mean, I could go through and into some secondary streets as well. So you take Bridge Street in uh, Coleraine, down by 20 per cent. Um, New Row in Coleraine, down by 10 per cent. You contrast that then with some of the, the retail parks, they are up by 20 per cent from what their, re, their valuation was before. So I would suggest, Mr. Deputy Speaker, if that is the average in those areas, there are plenty of winners in Coleraine and right across the East London area constituency. And I accept that not everybody is a winner, but in a revaluation, not everybody is going to be a winner. But there are a significant number of business properties in the Coleraine area, in East London area more broadly, and indeed right across Northern Ireland, who are reflecting where the market is, paying lower rates bills today than they were in the past. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. I call Mr. Martin Umbilwer. Um, I want to move back to the contentious questions of, of rates, uh, with the Minister's permission. Um, but perhaps let's take a different uh, angle on it, because the Minister said it's not his job to keep business open. And I understand around what he means, but would he not agree with me that for the losers, and there are losers in the rates revaluation, that our message should be that we will do more to support them in the time ahead, that we do not want to see them disinvest, uh, we want to give them every support we can, and we realise that not everyone can be a winner, uh, but together it is our job as an Assembly, as an Executive, to not only keep business open, but to ensure that business prospers. It's, it's, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's, it's certainly our job to support business. You know, it is business who creates the jobs, who makes the investment, and they need to be encouraged and supported in doing that. Uh, and if you take the rate system, as I mentioned in response to, to previous questions, I think this, re this executive has a very, very good track record in supporting businesses through our rate system. Um, as, as our main, I suppose, uh, fiscal lever that we have to pull, um, we have done that in terms of the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme. Um, I'm indeed going to continue that into, a, uh, into this current financial year. Uh, so several thousand businesses across Northern Ireland will receive that reduction in the rates bill cost to the executive of some £20 million. Uh, and we've done that um, in spite of the fact, Deputy Speaker, that it was introduced in 2010 to tackle the recession. Uh, and the legislation that governs it specifically talks about the downturn. Uh, that downturn has statistically passed. There are still effects uh, to retail business, just as there are to construction and other as a result of, of the downturn. Um, but there are other factors that are hitting our retail sector as well. And I'm very, very keen that we continue, as we are this year, through the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, to continue to offer support to that important sector. But yes, it's our, it's our job as a... We don't do the worry. It is, it is our, our captains of industry. It is those who are small business people who do the work, who create the jobs. It is our job in this business or in this assembly to support those businesses, to encourage them, and to do what we can through rates and indeed other interventions to allow them to grow. Mr. Mueller, for supplement. Uh, I want to thank the, the minister for his response. I wonder if the minister would consider, uh, and he has the, the, the facts and figures there and the stats in the time ahead, if we were able to look at those who had a 100% or more increase, uh, and these are talking about non-domestic properties, businesses, is there a way that we could look at that uh, cohort and find ways of going to them? Uh, would the minister agree, perhaps going to those businesses which took the biggest hit and seeing what extra help we can give them to ensure that they remain committed to growing their businesses here? The, this is something that has been considered well in advance, actually, of even the publication of the new, new values. And um, I was well aware that, given the fact that there would be losers in their revaluation, that there would be a call and a plea from, from many quarters for some special assistance, some sort of transitional relief to be put in place for those who were, quote unquote, the biggest losers in their revaluation. And I pondered that one carefully over a, a period of time, and I came to a very clear conclusion in respect of it. Um, whenever you look at those who are the biggest losers, many of them are very, very, very large businesses in terms of their, some of them are very big global businesses who have seen their valuations go up by 40, 50, 60, and even more in percent. Um, now, these are businesses that one would expect to be paying more compared to the 2001 valuations of those properties. So to be offering some support through the public purse 
which is in effect taking it from other ratepayers and giving it to these big businesses was something that I wasn't sure about the, I suppose, the ethics of, of doing. Um, I was obviously concerned about smaller businesses who would lose out as a result of the revaluation, and that's why um, rather than construct a sophisticated transitional scheme, which would have been on top of all of the other things that we would have been doing this year with the rates, which were very complex, we agreed to extend, and the executive and the assembly has endorsed it, uh, has agreed to extend that small business rates relief scheme, which will offer that additional £20 million pounds worth of support to thousands of businesses across Northern Ireland. Now, some of those will be businesses who have done okay out of the revaluation, but many of them, Deputy Speaker, will be businesses who have done badly out of the revaluation. So, I hope that that, uh, rather than some other transitional relief scheme, will be able to afford those businesses some support, allow them to continue to, to stay in business in the short term and grow, and grow in the longer term. Well, Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Change the tack. Uh, will the Minister confirm what criteria is being used to identify redundancies in the civil service? Yes, I'm going to go back to there was a question previously from Lord Morrow who asked about the scheme, and if the member will bear with me, I'll give him the specific criteria which was found. Uh, that was ad libbing, by the way, up to that point. Um, there are two criteria. Best, best value for money is the, the, the criteria that has been applied in order by grade and analogous grade and by discipline where necessary to determine uh, who should exit under the scheme are principally based around best value for money using the least cost up front. So that's the payment that would be required to give somebody a, a voluntary exit payment and the maximum payback, so how much it yields in terms of payable savings, and that's over a one-year period. Now that will in some cases have people who are exactly the same, uh, and in those situations where there is a tie on that criteria, random selection will be used. Mr McNary, for a supplementary. I'm grateful for the uh, Minister's uh, explanation there, Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, could he tell me what weight is being used uh, in age for these uh, redundancies? There, there is no weight used in age. Uh, it doesn't carry any more or less of an impact. Um, obviously, those who are over 60, and th this, the, the system that is governing this is legislation that passed through this House some years ago, a superannuation bill now act. Um, and for those who are over 60, and I'm, 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 um, if I say anything wrong, I'll correct this in correspondence to the member, but my answer is this is very true. The member understands is it. Yeah, this is it now. This is the law now. Um, any, those over 60 are, are not, don't get the same amount of payment. Um, they are capped at a, a six months salary as opposed to the 20 months salary for those who are under 60. Um, so obviously it, it, is, it may be financially, uh, in some cases, less attractive, but given the time of, uh, that they are at in their careers, there may be other reasons and other factors as to why people who are, uh, say, a little older uh, might find it still attractive to take up the voluntary exit scheme. Ms. Maeve McLaughlin. Mr. Last young quarter. Um, can, I, can I ask the minister, given the fact that the economy is effectively slowly emerging, if you like, towards recovery, would, would the minister agree that the time is, is now to actually urge the private sector to uh, raise wage levels, um, to reward workers who, in essence, have kept businesses moving forward in very difficult times? Uh, Mr. Speaker, Deputy Speaker, yes, I do. Um, I think that I, I say that, I say it quite clearly, um, knowing that whilst the economy is, is growing, and um, the latest figures in Northern Ireland suggest that a year on year increase from, of 1.2% between quarter three of 2013 and quarter three of 2014, unemployment has fallen for, the claimant count has fallen for 27 um, consecutive months. Unemployment is down at, at 6%. There, I, I say that. And, and we should welcome that, but I know that there are still many businesses who are struggling in Northern Ireland. But what I do know, and I knew this, uh, I'm sure mem many members in the House will know from contact with businesses in their areas, during the recession, many businesses, yes, they shed staff in extreme circumstances, some, some, some had to close, unfortunately, but others kept themselves going through cutting wages. And sometimes we talk, we talk about freezing and pay restraint in the, in the public sector, and we forget sometimes that in the private sector, pay cuts were the order of the day in many cases. I think as companies get back to strength and the economy grows and, and companies benefit from a growing economy here in Northern Ireland and in our, our neighbours and in other, other countries nearby and around the world, that that should be then reflected in increasing wages and increasing pay packets for our workers. 
Ms McLaughlin for a supplementary. Come on, good. And, and I thank the Minister and I welcome that clarification. And, and indeed, if the Minister is saying that he can see clearly that higher wage levels would, would indeed feed into and boost the economy, maybe the Minister could outline how he or indeed this House uh, or this executive could, uh, could promote that, that, that line of action. I'm very uh, uh, Going back almost to the question before, it's not my job to tell businesses how they should do their job. They're in a far better position than I am or indeed anybody in this House to know how their business operates, the market that they're operating in, the various circumstances that their particular business will be affected by. Uh, and whilst it's easy for maybe me standing at, at, at this position to look at the, the totality of the economy and say, yes, things are good, this sector's up, that sector's up, indeed, even the construction sector, which has been doing very badly, is showing some signs of growth and recovery uh, as well, that you can't really from this position or indeed any part of government dictate to firms and dictate to businesses that uh, what they are paying staff should be, should be going up. But I do think it is incumbent upon, upon our businesses, as the economy grows, as their businesses improve, that they pass on those benefits to their staff, who in, in many cases did absorb significant pay cuts during the recession uh, and stuck with those firms, stayed loyal to those firms so that those firms could retain the skills and experience that they brought. And if those businesses are doing well, and if the markets in which they are operating in are improving, then I think any sensible business in those circumstances should be increasing the wages that their, their staff are receiving. That obviously helps the economy in broad sense, but it also helps too in reducing uh, the benefits bill, as those sort of in-work benefits that sometimes are forgotten about in the debate around welfare reform would naturally reduce as people are getting paid more as well. Ms. Michelle McElvey. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister will no doubt recall the strike by Northern Ireland Water Staff in January and the impact on services that action had. Can I ask the Minister if he has received the pay remit for Northern Ireland Water? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I, I, I do recall uh, the strike and I recall the impact that it has. I'm sure there are. There are some members of this House who are representing constituencies in the west of their province and their constituents who remember it uh, far, far better than, than either she or I would. Um, the answer to her question is yes, I have received a uh, pay remit from Northern Ireland Water. I have received that, I received that at my desk at the end of March. Um, um, so at the end of March, I've had it for a couple of weeks and I've been carefully considering it over that period of time. Ms. McElveen for supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, when does the Minister expect to be in a position to take a decision? Mr. Deputy Speaker, the pay remit, as you would expect, deals with issues around pay for Northern Ireland water staff. Um, it also um, deals quite substantially with productivity, productivity issues and benefits that the Northern Ireland water management hope to be able to produce as a result of modernization and transformation moving forward. Um, I've been particularly, the pay side of it can be somewhat easy to look at and understand superficially. The productivity side of it I have been carefully considering over the last number of days and I actually, I hope, uh, Deputy Speaker, to be in a position to approve the pay remit uh, within the next 24 or 48 hours. Well, Mr. Cathal Ocean. Can I could ask the Minister for an update on the opening of uh, applications for peace funding. Remote. Sir, Deputy Speaker, the, um, the House will be aware that the Interreg 5 programme uh, has already been approved by uh, the European Commission. Um, agreement was reached within the Executive and between ourselves and the uh, Department for Public Expenditure and Reform in the Irish Republic in terms of the Peace f uh, 4 programme. Uh, that has been uh, transmitted to the Commission for their approval. They have come back with some queries, uh, which we are dealing with on a systematic basis, and I hope uh, that we will have approval for the scheme in the next number of weeks, which will allow it to go out to um, uh, open calls later on this year. Mr. O'Shane, for his supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Could I ask the Minister how confident he is that uh, there will be a quick turnaround for applications uh, in the next uh, round of peace fund, and there will be no further delays? Mr. Deputy, this is a, a, a constant uh, cry from, from, from people who are involved in the peace, various previous peace funding uh, schemes that uh, the process can be very long, it takes a long time, it can be very frustrating, and indeed I know there are many who have had perhaps their fingers burnt in the past and may not want to be involved in peace four because of experiences with uh, peace three. Um, but I am committed, and I know my counterparts in the Irish Republic are committed to trying to uh, cut down the, um, the time that it takes to assess 
uh, various schemes to allow the funding that is um, approved to go to the schemes as and when required. Uh, I, I say that, but I'm a absolute caveat that it's important, I think, that the various financial fiscal processes that we um, put public money through in Northern Ireland are continued to be uh, done and that we use those processes, but that we do so in a much more efficient uh, and much more quick manner. Time is up. We must move.